I'm Asha Mamtora from Lexus PSL Private Client and with me today is Chris Moorcroft, Senior Associate at Harbottle and Lewis. Um, Chris is here today to discuss considerations for non-UK domiciled individuals purchasing residential property in the UK. Um, so to begin with, Chris, mm. what do you think are the main issues for foreigners buying UK property? Um, well, I mean, I think they can broadly be split into three. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that people, most people would t tend to think about is tax. And there's loads of tax issues to think about for uh, a, a, a non-domiciled person buying uh, UK residential property. And we'll touch on some of these. But the headline one traditionally has always been inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone's buying a... Um, you know, prime London property for £10 million, um, it's quite a shock to them to learn that in, there will be inheritance tax on their death of up to 40%, which is, yeah. you know, £4 million. So um, that is um, the first one. And um, a second very important one is confidentiality. Yeah. So um, owners of UK property... Um, have their details at the land registry, which is a publicly available um, resource. And um, that causes many foreign buyers a big issue. Um, you know, there are lots of uh, kind of negative perceptions around that, about money laundering and those kind of things. And obviously, you know, those are things that, that none of us want anything to do with. But people also have very legitimate reasons for wanting to preserve confidentiality. Um, particularly people from parts of the world where, um, you know, that may be less stable mm -hmm. than the UK. Um, and, you know, frequently people are worried about things like kidnap risk, so they don't want people to know um, where they live. Um, they're worried about governments, which, um, you know, may, uh, uh, you know, dislike them or want to seize assets or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, Particularly at the moment, cyber security is becoming a major thing. Um, and so that's another kind of confidentiality issue. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing. And then the third one is succession planning. Um, clients who come from overseas will often not come from a system where you have a will and you go through probate with your asset. You know, things work in very different ways. So yeah. that whole process is, is sometimes a bit of a mystery. Um, sometimes you know something that they don't want to have to go through so um, those are the kind of three headline issues that you know these sorts of clients would would tend to worry mm -hmm. about okay um so how have people dealt with these issues in the past um in the past there's been a, a fairly um straightforward um solution which frankly you know got to the point that a lot of people sort of just took this off the shelf which is to use an offshore company to buy the property and historically that would have cured the inheritance tax issue by changing the situs of the property so that the individual didn't own a UK asset they owned a non-UK asset which would be shares in the offshore company mm -hmm. it would give them privacy um, because the company's details would be on the land registry and usually the company would be in a location where you couldn't get information about the um, owners of the, the shares um, and it would cure the succession planning issue because the, um, the property would remain owned by a company and so there would be no need to involve probate. And then sometimes you would get a trust put on the top of mm -hmm. the company, but that was the kind of standard um, okay. until recently. Hmm. Um, so I understand that the government has brought in a number of significant changes in the Finance Bill 2012. Yep. Um, would you be able to tell me a little bit more about these? Yep, absolutely. So this was basically a three-pronged attack on offshore companies owning high-end residential property. Um, so it came in three forms. First, um, a, a penal rate of SDLT. Mm -hmm. So from the date of, uh, of the budget in 2012, if you bought a property that was worth more than £2 million through an offshore company or certain types of other vehicle, um, you would pay a flat rate of 15% SDLT, which is significantly higher than you would pay if you were just buying in your own name. Um, the second thing that was introduced in um, 2013, but had been in talk, um, 
first put forward in Finance Bill 2012 was ATED, which stands for the Annual Tax on Enveloped Dwellings. And um, that is an annual tax, as, uh, as the name says, which, um, which applies, again, to offshore companies that own UK residential properties. Again, originally it was um, £2 million plus, plus. Um, and that started at £15,000 per year for um, properties worth two and five million and went up from there. Um, and then the third change was um, capital gains tax on these types of companies and other entities. That's a bit less relevant now because whilst it's still at, in place and needs to be thought about, there is now a general um, capital gains tax charge on non-residents that um, sell UK residential properties. The final thing that's worth saying on those changes is that the threshold got brought down um, subsequently. So whilst it started at two million plus, mm -hmm. it's now come down and it's now half a million plus. So in other words, any um, offshore company, um, onshore company, other entities which own UK residential property and which do not qualify for one of the exemptions are subject to these charges if the property is worth more than half a million. I see. So why were these changes brought in? Um, well, this is quite an interesting one. There are a number of reasons. Um, the, main, the main one, apparently, um, is um, to do with SDLT. So, you know, as I've explained um, at the start, the main reasons um, you might use a company were either inheritance tax planning mm -hmm or confidentiality or succession planning. Um, the government apparently thought that SDLT avoidance was the main reason people were using companies. So the thinking was that um, you can, if you have a, a company which owns a property, um, rather than sell the property and the buyer have to pay SDLT on that, you can opt to sell the shares of the company and the buyer could avoid paying SDLT. So that was the evil that it seemed like the government mm -hmm. were trying to sort of counteract. The truth is that not many um, uh, such transactions were actually carried out, and it certainly wasn't the prime uh, driver why so many uh, high-end properties were owned by companies. Um, but you know that was what they seemed to be targeting. Um, there are also wider political reasons. I mean, you know, this is a very political area at the moment. Um, you, there's a lot of um, concern among the government and the media around the fact that huge swathes of, you know, Westminster and Mayfair and, uh, and, and Kensington and the like are owned by offshore companies. And, you know, the kind of, uh, the transparency issues that raises, the money laundering issues that that mm -hmm. raises. So, you know, there have been a number of attacks on this and, uh, uh, and that is a big part of it, but tax is also a big part of it. Interesting. Um, so what happened in the recent budget? So um, the government um, brought a further, uh, uh, made a further tweak to this. And actually, it's what they should have done in the first place, because frankly, with the SDLT avoidance, they were barking up the wrong tree a bit. And, um, and so ATED and all those taxes were kind of designed, uh, well, in my view anyway, it, 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 in the wrong way. Um, the real tax motive for most people for using an offshore company for these acquisitions was inheritance tax and changing the status of the property. So what did they do in the last budget? They announced that from April 17, they will be making these types of companies transparent for inheritance tax purposes, which um, means that any individual, even non-domiciled non individual who owns an offshore company which owns a UK residential property will now be subject to inheritance tax on um, on the value of, of the property. Um, it makes things very complicated for offshore trusts which yeah. own offshore companies which own UK residential property. Um, and you know, generally it means that going forward offshore companies are going to be used pretty infrequently, I think, because the costs are going to vastly outweigh the benefits. Okay.
So um, because of this, what mm. options are now available uh, for individuals who want to or are considering purchasing property in the UK? Um, so you can buy in your own name. I mean, that's, that's the simplest way of doing it. Mm -hmm. You'll pay normal rates of SDLT rather than the penal rate. You won't have to pay ATED. Mm -hmm. um, you will have to worry about CGT, but um, because of various reliefs that are available to individuals, the CGT position could actually end up being better. Um, inheritance tax is going to be a problem if you buy in your own name, and there's well, there are there are other solutions. You could look at um, acquiring the property with debt, which will mm -hmm. which will help um, the inheritance tax issue. You could look at something simple like life insurance. Um, buying in your own name, putting aside tax, and it's really important that we don't always focus on tax because that's often not the driver. Um, buying in your own name will not help from a confidentiality perspective mm -hmm. or a succession planning perspective. However, on the confidentiality point, you could use a nominee company which would um, achieve that goal. Um, the other option is to, is to use an offshore company, um, but really, I mean, you're only looking at the non-tax benefits there, at the, um, the confidentiality and the succession planning benefits. From a tax perspective, it's, that's a bit of a disaster now because you're paying penal SDLT, you're paying ATED, you're not getting any inheritance tax benefits. So, you know, it very, I think very few people will do that going forward. Okay. So are there any other structures that could be used? There are. Um, the other obvious one is to buy through a trust with no underlying um, uh, offshore company. Mm -hmm. That is kind of a halfway house. Um, you pay normal rates of SDLT. You don't have to pay ATED. You get your um, confidentiality because the trustee's name will be on the land register. You get your succession planning um, because it, you won't have to go through probate. What it doesn't do is it, it, it well, except in rare circumstances, it normally won't work from an inheritance tax perspective because normally the person who creates the trust will want to um, be a beneficiary of the trust and use the property. So that will um, prevent it from working from an inheritance tax perspective. And also, if you have UK assets which are owned directly by offshore trustees, you are into the UK's relevant property regime, which for these purposes, most importantly, means you will have 10-year charges of up to 6% of the value of the property. So a trust is middle ground and it can um, tick a lot of boxes, but it, it's by no means a one-liner that the trust is, is an answer to everything. Okay, so um, what about existing structures? Um, this is where it gets extremely complicated um, and um, you know it, in a nutshell um, if there are where, where a client has a structure which involves an offshore company regardless of whether it's got a trust on top or not they're going to have to think about whether they want to use that going forward um, because, you know, chances are inheritance tax will have been the driver or a key benefit. Um, and once that goes in April 17, you're paying a, a very high price in terms of ATED and, you know, ongoing um, charges and uh, whatever else for the uh, privilege of using an offshore company um, for not, not very much benefit. The only thing, though, that I would say is that there are two issues. First, unwinding itself is not a one-liner. So um, in unwinding, you can trigger a load of tax charges. So it, some clients will feel kind of locked into structures which are proving quite expensive simply because it would cost too much for them to get out of the structures. So that's an issue, and, um, uh, and we need to see what the government are going to do about that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, thinking through all these tax issues, tax consequences of unwinding, tax consequences going forward, that's all fine. But, you know, always never make sure you never lose sight of um, the objectives for setting up the structure in the first place, which might be confidentiality, might be succession planning, might be something else entirely. 
and it's very easy because there are so many tax changes at the moment to get lost in this kind of tax world and only think with your um, tax hat on but actually there's much much more to it than that so there are many factors to balance um, but certainly between now and April 17 uh, there's going to be a lot of clients looking at these structures yeah. there's going to be a lot of restructuring going on. Thank you for coming in Chris. Thank you. Um, I'm sure all of our viewers will have found that very interesting while they wait for the upcoming changes to be announced in the Finance Bill 2017. Thank you.